I'm Kel. Uh, this is Alan. Uh, we're going to tell you about how we made our first Gutenberg theme. And uh, we'll start off with a quick introduction so you know who we are a little bit. Uh, I am a designer at Automatic. Uh, I do a lot of different things there, but right now the majority of my time is spent working on the WordPress.org team at Automatic, so I am spending most of my time just contributing directly back to WordPress, uh, which is a lot of fun. Hey, I'm Alan. Um, I'm a uh, theme imagineer at Automatic, and what that entails is uh, mostly designing and developing uh, WordPress themes with the future in mind, and so trying to uh, prepare themes for Gutenberg and other things that are coming in our future. Awesome. Um, so we're going to spend a few minutes up front to tell you a little bit about the theme that we built, and then we are going to jump into the details of how exactly we made it. Um, I'm going to talk about everything from the perspective of designing the theme, and then Alan is going to talk about the development angle of it as well. Uh, so it really started earlier this year. Uh, at that point, both Alan and I were fairly comfortable with Gutenberg, at least using it. We both tried it out, uh, but we were really unclear on the effect that Gutenberg was going to have on themes, which is something that both of us uh, build and use every day. So we built this theme to try to figure that out. Uh, the whole thing was really built out of a quick experiment. Uh, I spent a little time one afternoon uh, building out all of the default Gutenberg blocks in Sketch. And this is actually something that Tammy talked about uh, very briefly in her talk this morning. Um, but in case anyone's not familiar, Sketch is just a design application for the Mac. So in the, the same vein as Photoshop or uh, Adobe Illustrator. Uh, and in Sketch, you have the concept of something called symbols. And those are just reusable design elements. So things like icons or, uh, or buttons things that you'll use really frequently in your designs and you may not want to recreate them every time you need to use them. Uh, so you create a symbol that you can just place in a document anytime you need it. Um, so I spent one Friday afternoon building out a, a sketch library that included symbols for all of the default Gutenberg blocks. And what this did is uh, this library allowed me to quickly build out a page of Gutenberg blocks in sketch and uh, and then customize them. So my thought was that I would build out pages and then jump in and start customizing them and messing around. And I figured it would be a good way to start a theme design uh, here within my, my design tool uh, while keeping Gutenberg blocks as the base of that design. So for instance, I built a page like this, uh, which is just a quick like homepage exercise for a band that I made up. Um, just some simple elements, a cover image up at the top, some text blocks, uh, a photo of the band, and a grid of, of album covers. And then I somewhat aggressively uh, adjusted all the styles and colors and typography to transform those default Gutenberg blocks into the beginnings of a theme. Uh, and so I kept all the same elements. Uh, up at the top there is still like a cover image block. It has all the same elements of a cover image block, but they are just highly styled and moved around. Um, just with like brighter colors, bolder typography, uh, sort of a, I implemented a new grid. Um, and I made this single mock-up and I posted it along with the, that library of sketch symbols to uh, Theme Shaper, which is a blog that both Alan and I contribute to. Uh, and soon afterward, Alan suggested that he and I actually take this homepage comp that I had made and make that into an actual Gutenberg theme. So, uh, so we did. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, once I saw Kel's design, I was super uh, inspired by it. And I was like, we need to make this thing happen just to show how uh, you know awesome Gutenberg could be, and so uh, we really wanted to press the or push the boundaries of it and, and experiment with it to see you know what things we could get away with uh, and what things we you know couldn't. Um, uh, um, another thing we wanted to make sure that we did is uh, you know through our experimentation, um, share what we learned, both the things that uh, were useful and that 
work the same from a theme perspective and then also the things that might change and that might be difficult. And so we wanted to document that process and uh, share that information with the, the wider community. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we're, you know, most of our code is on GitHub. It's in uh, open source environments. And um, we also have a couple of posts that are up on uh, Theme Shaper that uh, explain kind of how we got to where we uh, landed on with the theme and, and what we learned. Um, and we, we will include links to all that uh, at the end. Um, so I'm going to jump in and I'll talk about uh, just the theme from a design perspective for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a handful of things that I learned while designing the theme. Uh, and I'll share ways that my design process ended up being different than it used to be before Gutenberg and some ways that it ended up being very similar in the end. Uh, so the first thing that I did after we decided to like really build that home page into a theme is I designed some blocks. And that made a lot of sense to me at the time because you know Gutenberg is all about blocks. That's what everybody talks about. So I was like, I'm really excited. I'm going to design some blocks. Um, but I quickly realized that it was important to design them within the context of pages. So stepping back for a second, this is the initial home page mockup that I had. And it did a really good job of setting the general design aesthetic that we were going to use for the theme. But uh, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to apply all those styles to all of the default blocks. And so I did. Uh, I figured we'd need all of these blocks designed. I figured it was creating kind of a pattern library, which is a, a highly prized tool for designers. Um, but uh, after a little bit, I realized designing each of these pieces individually on their own was a really weird way to go about it because you know, no user is ever going to see a page like this. Uh, no user is ever going to see just these blocks individually. They're going to like, use them all together to build something. Um, so I was missing the bigger picture, which is that like, a theme isn't just about individual blocks. It's really about how they all work together. So I wrote up a whole bunch of fake content for this fake band which was a lot of fun. And uh, I started arranging all of those blocks that I had designed into full pages. Uh, and so this is a tour page that I started making using all the blocks that I designed before. Uh, I got the cover image up at the top, uh, a wide width image below that. There's a button for pur purchasing tickets and a table for tour dates. And so I would iterate and experiment with all the styles on that page uh, and work out how that would, they would adapt to different breakpoints and stuff. And then uh, once I had things kind of the way that I liked them, uh, I'd migrate every one of those blocks back into my global pattern library so that I could use them again when I started the next page that I was designing. And so after a while, this resulted in a pretty decent span of pages, uh, enough to make a somewhat convincing fake fans website. And, uh, and I was fairly confident that all those blocks that I designed would actually work together nicely in the real world because I had, I had made these pages and I had used those blocks together with, e with each other. Uh, so I had a good sense of how they might work. Um, but in general, that cycle worked well for me. Where I just design a page just like you normally might uh, when you're designing a theme today, uh, but have it start from the base of blocks. And then when, you're, when you have the page looking the way you like it, just take those individual blocks out, put them in a block library somewhere, whether that's you know, in a, a set of symbols or whether it's just a separate document or something, uh, so that you can reuse those later on. Uh, but this process did highlight a few things that I was missing. Uh, and this is really where I realized that designing a Gutenberg-powered Gutenberg theme is still very similar to what we've always done, designing themes. And uh, there are lots of very traditional theme design elements that still have to be designed. Uh, you'll still need archive pages, page footers, the menu, comments, uh, all of these things that we all know and love from designing themes already. Uh, and designing these really wasn't all that different than it would have been without Gutenberg. However, uh, it was a little easier because I was thinking through the lens of blocks. So for instance, uh, this is just an entry summary. You know, pre-Gutenberg, it might have looked exactly the way it looks right here. There's a, a title, there's an image, there's a paragraph of text, there's a button. 
but thanks to Gutenberg, all of those elements are part of a pattern library. They all have names. They all are meant to be reused. And by the time I got to designing this element of the page, I, I already had all of the pieces, and I just had to put them together. The next major thing that I learned uh, was once we got a little farther into development, I realized that there are way more block variations than I originally thought. So uh, I didn't know originally that like cover image blocks could be aligned to the left or to the right. Uh, I didn't know that buttons can have uh, full or wide width variations. And as you can see here, uh, at least today in the editor, they don't even show any differently if you set them to full or wide width. But that's something that your theme probably should hook into and, and have styles for, even so. So not only was I just completely overlooking different variations like that, I was actually making design decisions early on that were actively working against things that Gutenberg does out of the box. So for instance, this uh, is our cover, our cover image design. And you can see that the text is aligned to the left-hand side. And when we originally built this in, uh, we hard-coded that because I, I hadn't realized that you know, users can and should be able to uh, adjust the alignment of the text. And so once, once we realized our mistake, uh, I had to kind of go back and adjust the design and make sure that you know, everything was going to work with that. Uh, and it ended up being a little better in the end. But uh, you know, you'll likely run into things like this when you design your first Gutenberg-powered theme, and you'll probably run into a few uh, less of them the next time you do it. Uh, but really, there's just a whole lot to discover in Gutenberg, and it's going to take a little time for, for us all to, to learn all of the ins and outs. And so the last thing I wanted to note before I hand it off to Alan to talk about design stuff for a little is that uh, I really liked designing cover image cover images specifically. And I think that cover images are a really great example of exactly what's so cool about Gutenberg. So anyone who's tried out Gutenberg is probably familiar with a cover image. It's one of the things that everyone shows off. It's probably one of the first blocks you might use. Um, but we all know that something as simple as this was, so it's just a, some text over an image. Uh, and something as simple as that was really difficult to do in the, the old editor. You know, you either had to know HTML and build that out. Uh, you had to find and install and activate a plugin that did that, or you had to hope that your theme allowed you to have something that looked like this somewhere on the home page that you could, you know, maybe adjust with the customizer or something. But it was a hassle. And with Gutenberg, anyone can just put this in there, out of the box, and, and they can put it anywhere they want on their entire site. So it's a really great example of uh, taking something that used to be really difficult and just making it easy for everyone. And from a theme perspective, cover image blocks are like a designer's playground. Uh, it's basically just a poster or a page design exercise in itself. It's just text and an image. and can do whatever you want with that. Uh, so I really personally loved exploring the relationship between the image and the text, uh, designing different variations of sizes and colors uh, and alignments later on. Um, and I explored the way that different types of images, like illustrations versus photographs, would work with, with the design of the cover image blocks. And the absolute coolest thing is not only did I get to play with that, but thanks to editor styles, which Alan will talk about in just a minute, uh, thanks to that, users can, they can make all of these themselves. They can play with it and they can design uh, right there within the editor, which was really not possible before. Uh, and so with that, it really turns the editor into a design tool for the user. And I think that's really exciting. So yeah, here's Alan with more development stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so yes, yeah, so let's talk about this, uh, the code that went into this music thing that we worked on. Um, the, the one thing that I was a bit scared of before doing uh, this, working on this project is, you know, I didn't, I don't have a ton of JavaScript background, and so I was worried that 
building a theme with uh, Gutenberg would be just not possible, not without having you know uh, JavaScript as a, as a uh, strong point. Um, but what I realized is that the theme process doesn't really change that much, um, which was really good news for me. Like most of the uh, the templating that you do, like archive pages, indexes, header.php, almost all of it stays the same. Um, and so it just kind of gave me a lot of confidence that I'd be able to build, you know, Kel's amazing design. Um, the, one of the, the, the things we realized early on as well was that, um, you know, you're going to want your theme to work without Gutenberg, especially now where it's still in the process of being worked into core. Um, and so an easy way to do that is to develop your theme without Gutenberg first. And so if you, uh, you know, use a process similar to ours where we focus first on the design uh, in, in the beginning and then jump into the code, we're able to kind of uh, uh, build the theme as a normal theme first and then add in Gutenberg. And then that way we're covering both of, our, both of those bases without having to do additional work or take things in or out uh, based off of whether a, a user or a customer has uh, Gutenberg installed. Um, and then from there, after you get your theme developed without Gutenberg, then you go ahead and add Gutenberg support to your theme. And for this, uh, I won't get too deep into code just because it's just hard to really get into it in this, this uh, presentation format. But um, to, to install it, you basically uh, can go to wordpress.org, download a plugin, and install it uh, manually. Install it via the uh, WP admin. Later, when uh, WordPress 5.0 is released, um, Gutenberg will be added to core. And uh, uh, You'll be able, if you want to keep the editor, you know, add a plugin to use the old editor um, for those that basically want to stay in the past. But uh, if you're like us, <laughs> you want to keep things moving forward, um, uh, you'll just go with the Gutenberg standard that'll come in core in 5.0. Um, and this is all you really need to get started with Gutenberg today. Um, it works mostly out of the box. Even if your theme doesn't directly support it, you can still, the, uh, the, the, the work that you do with Gutenberg does display on the front end of the site. Um, but, you know, for us, we wanted to make sure that we push that fur further than just the out of box, out of the box experience, and uh, you know, build the theme in a way where we uh, uh, supported Gutenberg. Um, once installed, you'll get an editor uh, that works essentially like this, where you can uh, build in blocks and organize your content in a, a more dynamic way. Um, it util utilizes blocks to give you a content-rich experience. Um, that helps you just build a, a, a or tell a better story. Um, you can do much more detailed um, uh, layouts and um, organize your content in a way that um, is just much more dynamic than what you can do with the traditional editor. Um, another thing to be mindful of is the, this uh, WP content function, which is essentially what outputs the content that's in the editor. Uh, when it comes to Gutenberg, there's, you know, because the blocks are so much more complex than regular uh, editor content, you just have to be careful with wrappers and any uh, other type of HTML that might interfere with what is output by the WP content function. Um, and this will just allow you to do uh, more things with the blocks that, uh, uh, you know, that come with Gutenberg. Um, so the next thing is uh, with styling uh, music theme uh, for Gutenberg. A lot of that went into uh, adopting uh, the blocks that Kel designed and turning them into, uh, or basically making CSS to support the designs that he that he built. And so um, it's kind of similar to what you do with editor.css, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, a lot of themes, or not a lot, but a few themes use that currently, where you can kind of make the uh, appearance of the, the current editor look like the front end a little bit. Um, with Gutenberg, you can push that much, much further. And so uh, we spent a good amount of time making sure that the, uh, basically the Gutenberg experience looks, uh, or spent a bunch of time making sure that that Gutenberg experience looks as much like the front end as possible. Um, and this just basically makes it so that your users aren't you know, confused by what they see in the back end um, versus what they see on the front end. Um, and you also kind of have to, uh, because of the some of the options and stuff that Kel mentioned and the the different things that users can change within the blocks, you have to kind of be keep that that all in mind as you're developing um, because they'll you know be able to do things beyond some uh, what you you might envision for a particular block and so you just want to 
uh, keep that in mind as you're, as you're going through the development process. Um, for this part, I'm just going to explain some of the, uh, how we have the styles organized in music theme. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, I guess maybe an optional way to do this. There's a number of different ways to organize the styles in, uh, when using, uh, or when, when building a theme with Gutenberg. Um, but this is pretty close to what we ended up uh, doing for ours. And so the first file you see here is uh, editor.css. And those are, or this, this file is, is specific for um, the editor experience with Gutenberg. Um, and so it's only styles that don't appear on the front end. Um, and you'll find this useful because the blocks in the editor have different class names than they do in the front end. And so you'll have to basically build a, a style sheet that just addresses the Gutenberg editor. And so editor.css is that style sheet. Um, you also see style.css here, which is the main theme style sheet. And this is uh, basically the global uh, theme style sheet. And so you have everything from the headers, the footers, archive pages, everything that's not Gutenberg and everything that is Gutenberg uh, can exist in that style.css uh, file. Um, but for music theme, we sort of uh, broke out uh, blocks.css just to address Gutenberg specifically. Um, and so the blocks.css file is essentially enqueued uh, 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 on the front end of the site. And so it, it deals with blocks from Gutenberg, but it doesn't touch the editor um, like in the admin area at all. Um, here's a, an example of how we enqueued our blocks.css for the front end. It's just similar to what you would do with uh, you know, a style, like the main theme style sheet where you enqueue it on the front end. Um, and uh, in doing it this way, we just were able to have like a separate uh, style sheet that only addressed the blocks and how they appeared on the front end. And the same is for the editor, uh, where instead of, uh, but the only difference is that instead of addressing the front end, we're uh, addressing the back end here. Um, and this just gets include, uh, enqueued uh, to the, uh, directly to the Gutenberg editor, so it only appears there. Um, and again, you can use it to fine tune blocks so that they appear uh, more consistently, uh, or said so they appear, you know, in the editor more consistently with how the front end looks. Um, this is another optional thing here that you can add. Uh, it's for edit. It's for it's an editor color palettes uh, uh, support thing that that you see here. So what's what's happening is that it's uh, basically adding a color to the Gutenberg editor for certain blocks. You can change colors like background colors and text colors, and so. If you include and queue the uh, colors that you use in your theme um, into Gutenberg, then users can select those same theme colors right there in the editor so that everything match, uh, matches on the front end. Um, and so it's really useful. I highly recommend using this, but it's definitely an optional feature um, that you may or may not want to uh, in include. Um, and the same goes for this uh, align wide support. Um, this is something I think that uh, every theme should support, but you may have a case where you might not want to use it. But um, essentially, it's a way to uh, break out uh, certain blocks so that they uh, can span wider than the actual content area of a, of a theme. Um, and so for a lot of times, like on uh, a lot of medium sites, use this quite a bit where you'll have like a wide image that just stretches the full size of the, of the browser window. Uh, by adding this support, you'll, you're able to, to add that functionality to, to Gutenberg. Um, and kind of like what I've been hinting at uh, earlier is the, the editor experience is integral to, uh, uh, to, to, to Gutenberg. And for us, making the back end look like the front end is, it's just, it just makes things easier for everybody, um, including, uh, or, or particularly for, for your users. You want them to know what in the back end, uh, how things are going to be organized and how they're going to look. So on the front end, they feel confident um, what's, what's going to appear. And so, seeing this example here on the left is just a standard Gutenberg uh, uh, layout. And you need to notice how like the cover image block doesn't really look the same. The fonts are a little different. The spacing is a little different. Um, and this is just, it's, uh, it's just it can make things confusing for your user uh, where they, you know, won't associate the front end with the back end. And that can, uh, can be problematic. And so instead, you want to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time in that editor.css file uh, making sure that the blocks look as closely as possible to the front end. And so you see here, the cover image now looks the same. Uh, the spacing and the fonts and all of that ties in. We did run into a few issues with uh, the alignment and the background colors, where we uh, just didn't, uh, couldn't find a, a good way to have that uh, gray background with the white box around the actual block. 
Um, it got a little tricky to do that in the editor, and so we're hoping we'll, we're, uh, we can basically iterate on that a little bit later. Um, and so another thing, when you're working on a theme, uh, both in the design and the development uh, phases, you're going to come up with ideas for blocks that, aren't, are, that don't already exist. There's tons of them you know, that, that come with Gutenberg out of the box, but depending on what your theme's purpose is and uh, you know, who is the audience uh, the theme is for, uh, you might have ideas for, for blocks that don't exist. Um, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to the theme portion of, uh, or the theme development portion, it's not a good idea to build your uh, custom block inside of a theme. Um, it's, it kind of follows the same rule of thumb that plugins do, where uh, when you're working on a, uh, when you're trying to figure out whether to add a feature to a plugin versus a theme, the rule of thumb is essentially kind of that. Uh, uh, on the theme side, is, is essentially it, is just dealing with the uh, presentation layer or how things look, how things are organized, maybe how they behave. Whereas uh, for plugins, you're adding new features. Um, and uh, blocks kind of work on the plugin side, where you're adding new features to the core functionality of WordPress. And so because of that, you don't want to create a scenario where if you have a custom block and a theme, and a user wants to change that theme later on, once they change that theme, they're going to lose any data or information that they had in the, in the block that only existed in that theme. And so you don't want to create that scenario. So it's uh, really important to, if you do have custom block ideas, uh, if you're going to make them, to just build them into a theme and install them separately. Uh, sorry, build them into a plugin um, and uh, install them separately from the theme. Um, Another thing is that uh, block development and theme development are very different. Uh, I kind of learned this the hard way. I thought that, uh, you know, actually while we were working on music theme, Kel came up with a, a couple of really interesting uh, blocks that were, were just really nice. Like there was an audio one with track lists. Um, there was a few others that were really useful for a musician, um, which was our target audience. But, uh, and so I spent a little time to try and figure out, you know, how to, you know, build one of those things. And, my, my background is mostly theme development, um, which is largely PHP, HTML, CSS. And when it comes to block development, uh, it's just a lot of JavaScript. And not having that uh, background uh, just yet, it just it made it difficult for me to, to, to uh, uh, figure out how to build one um, uh, uh, from scratch. And so something I'm, I'm definitely going to you know, take some time to, to, to get a little bit better at. But uh, for now, it's, it's just good to know that, you know, it, when you do have that idea, if you do want to make those, uh, a custom block or something like that, it's going to be different than uh, developing a, uh, a theme. Yeah. So, let's see. Um, another thing you can do is uh, extend a block, which is, a basic, which is basically like um, adding an additional option or feature to a block that already exists in core. Uh, again, in some situations, this is okay to do in a theme, but more, uh, more than likely, it's better to do it in a, in a plugin, just because if you're if, if that new thing that you're uh, adding to a, a pre-existing block uh, has content associated with it, you don't want to lock it into the theme. Um, otherwise, if it's a, a you know a feature that you're adding and it doesn't have content associated with it, maybe it's an extra class or something that you're added or a color thing that has to do specifically with your theme, you might be able to get away with doing that. Uh, uh, via you know, extending a block within your theme, and so you just want to, you know, be mindful of uh, how, you know, uh, any custom things you do to blocks might affect a user if they switch away from your theme. Um, and so this was actually an example of, of uh, how we were able to get around uh, extending a block. Like I mentioned, I had a little trouble with the JavaScript stuff, but what we ended up doing is adding um, some additional classes to our blocks that allow users to uh, type in uh, a color class right on the block that on the fly changes the color right there in the editor. Um, and so it's not as smooth as like an ex as extending a block might be, but it works really well and it didn't require any uh, extra JavaScript knowledge to, to pull this off. And so um, you can do you know, some, some interesting stuff with uh, uh, just the classes on, on a block. And uh, we'll share a bunch of resources on this link here, both to uh, the theme shaper posts that we, we both worked on and a few other resources about uh, you know, extending blocks, building blocks from scratch, uh, and uh, a few other things. So be sure to check out that link and uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions. Oh, got one here?
Um, yeah, so the, que the question was about uh, cover images and essentially how, how to make them work on various screen sizes. Um, and so the way we handled it for the music theme is, uh, I think we have, this, yeah, I'll go back to where we have the screenshot of, uh, of a cover image on both. So um, yeah, that image right at the very top, uh, we're coming to see you and then the image. Uh, what that is is a cover image block on both. And when we built this, we just used uh, viewport height units in CSS to make sure it was matching uh, the, the screen size that we wanted. So in this case, uh, if you were to view this mobile screen on an actual device, we have uh, responsive styles that kick in and will make it the exact height of the viewport because that's what we wanted in this case. Um, and, and it behaves a little bit differently on larger screens because like you said, we, we didn't want it to be like taking over your entire screen all the time in that case. Um, so it was really just hooking into responsive styles and, and uh, just tweaking it to get, to get it however you want. But there was a lot of flexibility there because uh, it's really, cover image blocks and all blocks really are just, they're just basic HTML output. Um, so they're really easy to hook into and style however you'd like. Anyone else? Yes. Um, you don't have the ability to code and make new blocks. There's a lot of plugins and producer things that you short code. Can you put those into those blocks? Like if you have a regular block and you put short code for something that mm -hmm. does a specific thing into that block. So the, the question is uh, if you. If you don't want to include custom blocks and thing in themes. Uh, could you rely on short codes instead? Is that yeah, essentially? I don't know JavaScript. Right. Uh, you can. Right. You you can. Uh, however, I think it, it still goes back to what Alan was saying before. In that, if it's something that's really just going to affect the presentation uh, of the theme, then that makes sense. But uh, just like any other short code, if if it's something that would break if somebody, I guess a short code would break if they changed their theme, uh, if it was built in. So you just don't want to build something in via a short code that's going to break the user's site or look like it's broken if they were to change away from the theme. But that's the point with, with the short codes. You can change themes, but if it's a plugin. If it's built as a plugin, right. as a plugin then plugin, yeah, that's yeah. all set. Yeah. yeah, then that's fine. So you can still use that in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So you were talking a lot about building these blocks and plugins, which I very much agree with. I love that idea. The situation that we encounter is we're building things is that one site will want one thing a little bit different, and another site will want another thing a little bit different. And the way that we handle that in the past is by adding focus and action to some of the to be able to modify things. So I'm wondering if you have run across any similar patterns for a modifying a very general group or block that would let us. That's interesting. I, uh, it, it sounds kind of like a like a extending blocks is what you're doing, um, and uh, I definitely found some examples of that, and they're they're linked on the uh, slide that we'll put back up. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's that would probably be the best way to do that. And if you did those extensions in a plugin, then they could be you know uh, interchangeable with the theme, uh, or as you change themes rather. Yep. Mm -hmm. Got one in the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Oh, can you speak up just a little? It, you said it, so extending the blocks. Ah, oh, yeah. right, right. Okay. Yeah. It's good to know. <laughs> uh, so he was just saying. Oh, uh, because Gutenberg is built on React, uh, it is, it's built in a way that kind of expects you to extend on blocks. Right. There was another one over here. That one back there. On editor versus, versus front end styles, mm -hmm. um, did you do anything in particular with tooling or how you arrange your workflow to accommodate kind of two destinations? 
<laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah, so we, yeah, so we we built a uh, music theme with SAS, and that made it much easier to kind of manage uh, where code would appear, where styles would appear. Um, I we didn't show all of that just because it's really complicated to to explain if you don't already understand how SAS works. But we did, you know, use that to basically make sure that um, you know the the block styles both in the editor and the front end are present. And then we had the editor.css file would basically add tweaks on top of that just for the editor. Um, because the editor, uh, you know, it doesn't have the same theme width. It doesn't have a lot of the wrappers and stuff that, that are actually exist on the front end. And so your selectors are going to be different there. And so we basically use SAS to kind of uh, make sure that the same things that needed to be in the same place were there. And then any tweaks, we would just add on top of them with editor.css. Um, for the back end, and then for the front end, it was just you know the full uh, main style sheet that, that appeared there. So yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that, that's something you could do with extending a block. And like I mentioned, like that would be a case where, especially if you're taking something out, you could probably do that in the theme. Um, when a user would switch, they wouldn't lose anything. They just would probably just gain a few extra options with a different theme. And so you could definitely uh, extend a block <laughs> to remove stuff from it, which sounds <laughs> kind of backwards. But uh, yeah, that, that would be the way to do it. Yep. How many custom blocks did you end up making with that theme? It was just with two, I think we had. Uh, <laughs> Well, we, we didn't end up building any. Yeah, we but. didn't build any. <laughs> yeah, but we designed. Um, I know that there was an, yeah, an events we one. A few. Yeah, there was an, an, an events uh, block um, that was specific for music, where it had like the time, like the, the, the places where you're going to be visiting, ticket links, all that type of stuff. Um, and then there was like a player, uh, like a music player that had like an album list, album cover type of thing. Um, and there, there's some examples of it in the mocks and the slides. Um, but uh, yeah, we only designed it. We didn't get to the to the code. Yeah. Oh, so we didn't develop the, the custom blocks. Oh. We didn't, yeah, we didn't get that far. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, still a bit of a hurdle for me personally, just uh, not having a huge JavaScript background. And so I want to, uh, I'll probably have to uh, spend a little time with the slides in the previous uh, session uh, before I jump into that pool. But um, yeah, but it, it, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, at this point. But yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> yep. uh, do you think there's things that the Gutenberg team could do to make it easier for the developers? I have a suggestion. Um, so uh, much of this feedback has already been shared. Uh, but, um, but Alan alluded to the fact that in the editor, not all of the block class names are the same as on the front end. Uh, and in fact, some of them, for instance, if you set a, uh, on the front end, if you change a block and set it to align wide or align full, uh, you get a class that's added to it that says align wide, align full. And you can just hook into that with your styles, and it's really easy. That doesn't always happen in the editor. And so you have to, um, for a couple blocks, you have to hook into like a data attribute or something in your CSS, which is really weird to do. Um, so really, I think the biggest piece of feedback would be to, to make sure that uh, that all of the, the structure of the blocks and the naming, uh, class names and stuff, are all consistent but in both places. Because that would really speed up development and eliminate a lot of the kind of testing and, and uh, back and forth that was necessary. All right, I think that's all, all we got. But um, we will be around in case anyone has questions. And thank you very much.